Hey everyone, welcome to Sarah's Cross-Dressing Stories. Today I'm going to share with you Sister's Plan and my beginning part 84. If you're new to the channel then please subscribe now for more captivating stories and, please support me on Patreon and get early access at patreon.com slash sarah101. Bill Marshall was waiting for me in the lobby of the inn at 8 a.m., and Earl was waiting at the curb with the limo as we stepped out in the bright sunlight. The weather prediction was for warm temperatures today, so I wore a normal business suit, with a skirt that came down to just above my knees. The plane was also ready to go and within 10 minutes of arriving at the airport, we were rolling down the runway on our takeoff run. The trip that would have taken us about an hour in the limo, took less than 10 minutes of flying time. The plane had only climbed up several thousand feet when it was time to start descending. If we hadn't been going to Connecticut also, it wouldn't even have paid to take the plane. The limo that Nancy had arranged was waiting for us at the Glens Falls Airport and the driver of the limo knew the address so we sat back and relaxed for the short ride. We arrived at North Country Paper Box about 30 minutes early. The parking lot was mostly empty and the grounds were very unkempt. Of course, it could just be owing to the fact that it was spring and they hadn't started any grounds maintenance yet, but I got the impression that they hadn't done any in quite a while from the matted, twisted clumps of dead grass all around the building. I reminded myself that I wasn't here to hire a gardener as we got out of the car. We walked to the front door of the office and found it locked. Bill tried again and then knocked. We waited for a couple of minutes before Bill suggested that I wait there while he went around to the loading dock area to see if he could find someone. I stood there for perhaps 10 minutes before I saw any signs of life inside. Bill and another man emerged from a rear door and came towards me. The man fished a key from his pocket and unlocked the front door, pushing it open to admit me. As I stepped inside he said, I'm sorry, Miss Drake. You arrived early and I was working in the back. We don't have any office staff, so I never unlocked the front door this morning. It's quite all right. Are you Mr. Tavallo? Yes. I'm sorry, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Edward Tavallo. Owner and manager of the North Country Paper Box Company. I'm pleased to meet you. I'm Darla and Drake. It's a real pleasure to meet you. Welcome to Kalingkill. Thank you. If you follow me, I'll show you the plant. We followed Mr. Tavallo through the office area, down a narrow hallway, and through the doorway that divided the office section from the plant. As Mr. Tavallo showed us around he explained about the equipment and how it operated. It was a different brand than the ones that I had read about, but I recognized each piece before he spoke. As we walked around I only counted five employees, where I would have expected a plant this size to have a shift size of at least 40, including an office staff of five. Things seem a bit slow today, Mr. Tavallo, I said. Not just today. We've been like this for more than a year. Another company absorbed our main customer, an electrical equipment manufacturer, and we lost the contract at the end of its term since the new parent already had a supplier. Since then we've survived by picking up a few small contracts here and there. I started this company when I first got the contract from the electrical equipment manufacturer. I subcontracted most of the work during the first couple of years until I was able to borrow enough to build this place, but we had five good years before we lost the account. Since then, I've used up all of my money making the payments on the loans. I guess that it was my fault for placing all of my eggs in one basket. As we walked around, we could see the signs of neglect in the factory. Garbage littered the floor in places, and several machines were obviously not functioning. At least they hadn't tried to cover up the mechanical failures as the three clowns had in Greenfield. We spent almost an hour touring the factory before going to Mr. Tavallo's office. Well, Miss Drake. Are you interested in my factory? I'll be honest with you, Mr. Tavallo. I would have trouble putting a value on your plant. You've admitted that you don't have many clients or many prospects for more, so the goodwill component is almost non-existent. The condition of your equipment is poor, and you're in a remote location which makes for a limited labor pool. Well, the equipment can be restored, but it will take some money. As far as the location goes, we're fairly close to the city of Glens Falls. 
It's a small city, but still a city, and we're only an hour's drive away from the Tri-City area of Albany, Schenectady, and Troy. They're all large cities and offer a good potential market for a company such as yours that has a good marketing operation. How much were you expecting to receive for your company? Mr. Tavallo? I have about $270,000 left on my loans. Accounts payable are about $40,000 more. I wasn't able to pay my property taxes this year and I owe payroll taxes as well. Call it $400,000 in liabilities and I personally guarantee that it will not be over that. The plant sits on five acres here and there is more land available if the new owner wants it. I estimate the building and equipment to be worth about $1.85 million. I want to get out before my back is firmly against the wall, so I'll be willing to let it go for $500,000 and you assume the debt. I thought for a minute. I'd have to disagree about the value of the plant, but I'll think it over and get back to you. Thank you for showing us around today, Mr. Tavallo. Uh, does that mean that you're not interested? No, it means that I'll think about. But I heard that you always make an offer on the spot if you're going to buy something. I've done that, but only when I'm convinced that the deal is a great one and that I risk losing it if I wait. In other words, a real bargain. How about if I trim 20% off the price? Make it $400,000 and it's yours. It sounds better, but I still have another company to look at today, and I'm only going to buy one. Okay, my lowest price. $300,000 and you've bought yourself a company. $300,000? Yes. I thought it over for a minute. I wondered why the price was dropping so quickly. It's tempting, but I still have to look at the other plant before I make any decisions. Okay, my final offer. $250,000 and it's all yours. The warning bells were all going off in my head now. The price had dropped too quickly. Either he had started much too high to give himself lots of room to maneuver, or he was desperate with a capital D, I have to admit that you make it difficult, but I still want to look at the other plant before I decide. I promise to call you tomorrow though. Mr. Tavallo had a dejected look on his face when he said, Okay, I'll look forward to hearing from you. It was only a little after 12 o'clock when Bill and I left and we had plenty of time before our next appointment. The flight to Danbury only took 30 minutes so after the limo arrived we went to a restaurant for lunch. We really lucked out for having selected a restaurant at random and the king crab legs that I ordered were delicious. I intended to remember this restaurant in case I was in the area again. It was about 2.30 when we arrived at Eastern Business Forms. This plant was the opposite of what we had just seen with North Country Paper Box. The exterior was neat and clean, and the parking lot was crowded. We walked into the office and were greeted by a receptionist who asked us to have a seat while she paged Mr. Baird. We only had to wait for several minutes before an older man in an expensive suit came out to greet us. Miss Drake? I'm Ronald Baird. Welcome to Danbury. Thank you, Mr. Baird. This is Mr. Marshall, Finance Director at Piermont. How do you do, Mr. Marshall? Won't you both join me in my office? We followed Mr. Baird into a well-appointed office and took seats in front of his desk. Coffee, or perhaps tea? Tea for me, thank you, I said. Coffee, please, Bill said. Mr. Baird made a call and placed the orders. While we waited, I said, I was surprised to receive a letter from you, Mr. Baird. Most of the letters that I receive are from people desperate to sell before the taxman or the bankruptcy court closes them down. He chuckled and said, No such worry here, but I do want to sell. I didn't know that until I saw your picture on that issue of the paper press. He stopped talking when there was a knock at the door and a woman came in carrying a tray containing the tea and coffee. After she left, he continued. As I was saying, I only decided to sell after I saw that picture. I wasn't very much older than you are when I first started my business. It was just after the start of World War I and I had picked up a printing press and several boxes of type at an auction. The press was old and no one else wanted it so I got it cheap. 
Until then I had been shining shoes and it took every cent that I had saved to buy the press, some paper and ink, and set up my business in the basement of the house where we lived. The landlord let me use it cheap because it was damp down there. The moisture played havoc with the printing process. The paper swelled and the ink wouldn't dry. Anyway, I started off by printing handbills for merchants. After a year of working 16 hours every day, I was able to move to a real retail store location, and the rest is history. When I saw that picture of you, with your youth and energy, I remembered my own early years, and I decided that it was time to retire and enjoy what years I have left. It seems like I haven't done anything else but work since I was a teenager. I wrote that letter the same day that I received the magazine. For the next half hour, Mr. Baird told us the whole story of how he had built his business. It was after three when Mr. Baird said, we had better get going if you want to see the factory in operation. We shut down at 4.30 and the machines are shut down before that so that they can be cleaned. Mr. Baird led the way to the plant. We received a narrative of each operation as we came to it. It was obvious that Mr. Baird could perform any job in the plant. We watched as paper was printed, interleaved with carbon paper, page-numbered, perforated or cut, and folded or stacked so that they could be placed into boxes. Some of the operations produced generic forms, but about half were customized with company logos. We were still in the plant when they began to shut down. We watched as machines were cleaned in preparation for the next day's operation. We stayed around until they began to sweep the floors and then returned to Mr. Baird's office. Well, what do you think of my operation, Miss Drake? It seems to be very efficient, Mr. Baird. A lot of the equipment appears quite new. Yes. I've tried to keep up with the new innovations. It pays by being less labor-intensive and offering features that some others can't. We haven't begun yet, but we're about to move into printing custom computer forms. The new equipment was installed for that purpose. I see. Well, I guess that the only thing that we haven't discussed yet is money. Here's our financial statements, Mr. Baird said as he handed both Bill and me a folder. After looking it over I said, very nice, Mr. Baird. Net profit of 1.86 million on sales of 4.62 million last year. Yes, I've done quite well. I'm a wealthy man in my own right. I don't see any mention of notes here. There aren't any. I've never liked paying interest to a bank so I've always paid them off as soon as possible. I guess that the only thing left to discover is the asking price, I said. Without hesitating he said, 12 million. Only 12 million? That's just the value that's listed for the plant and equipment. Yes, that's the current value after depreciation, he said. But it doesn't even include inventory on hand or accounts receivables, much less goodwill. He just nodded slowly. I have two conditions. I waited for a few seconds before saying, and they are? Guaranteed employment of all of my employees for five years. If you must lay anyone off, they receive severance pay equivalent to five years of their salary as of the end of last year, less any salary that has been paid to them following the date of the transfer. That includes overtime, bonuses, and benefits. That's roughly equivalent to a $5 million guarantee. I thought about it for a few seconds. And the other condition? That you won't sell the plant for five years. Those are rather unusual terms. Yes, and I wouldn't get them from 99% of the companies that would like to acquire Eastern. But I think that you're different. I think that your company has concern for its employees and the economic health of the regions where it does business. I already know that a Mary Moore has health and retirement benefits comparable to what I offer. I want to guarantee, to the greatest extent possible, that my own retirement doesn't throw a monkey wrench into the personal lives of my people. Many of them have been with me for more than 10 years, and a few for almost 30. As I said, I'm fairly wealthy, and I want to do this for my people. I'm offering you the business, at probably 5 million less than I could get from others, in order to get those conditions. I thought about the conditions for a minute. Why don't you just sell at the higher price and give the five million to your employees? He smiled and looked off at nothing before returning his gaze to me as he answered. 
I thought about that, but I know that some of them would blow their newfound wealth in a month and then not even have a job. I want to provide a stable environment for everyone for at least five years, as well as for the area. What about transferring employees to another location? If they go voluntarily, no problem. If the transfer is used as a way to get them to quit, they get the severance. There must be a procedure established for dismissal of employees for justifiable causes such as drinking on the job or showing up for work while under the influence, fighting, consistent tardiness or absenteeism, etc. We can't allow employees to believe that we have to pay them a salary for five years if they sit in the lunchroom reading magazines all day. As long as the each case is documented and provable, I have no objection. How would you require payment of the 12 million? I'm flexible. I already have a very healthy bank account and stock portfolio. I never married so I don't have any heirs to worry about. What would you offer? How about 2 million at the transfer and then 1 million on each anniversary for the next 10 years? Okay, plus interest computed at the prime rate. I smiled. Done, but no prepayment penalty. Of course we'd like a little time to verify all of the information in these reports. I hope that you don't mind. Mr. Baird smiled back. I wouldn't expect anything less from a savvy businesswoman. Wonderful. Mr. Marshall will make arrangements for an audit while our attorneys get your conditions written to your satisfaction and translated into legalese. After some small talk, Bill and I took our leave. We had sealed our agreement with a handshake. The trip back to the airport only took 10 minutes. Once on the plane, I asked Bill for his thoughts. It looks like a sound deal. From day one, it will be producing profit if these reports are accurate. We don't have to staff it, fix the equipment, or try to arrange funding. After the initial payment, the profits will cover the payments and interest with money left over. It's absolutely a turnkey operation. I don't see any downside, except having to keep all of the employees. It means that we can't consolidate accounting and sales operations with our present operations for five years. About the only thing that we have to do is modify the accounting system to be compatible with our system and retrain the accounting people to use it. I'll work out a plan for that while performing the audit. Thank you, Bill. The operation looks so efficient that I don't expect that we'll find any unexpected bonuses. No. But I'm not expecting any bad surprises either. It appears to be a stable business at a $5 million savings. You sound disappointed, I said. Maybe I am, a little. The Greenfield acquisition was fun. This one doesn't present much of a challenge. I could always buy North Country Paper Box if you want a real challenge. It would be that. Are you considering it? I think that it would be too much of a challenge. No business. Only a few experienced employees. Equipment problems. No office personnel at all. Greenfield may have been all but underwater, but I think that North Country Paper Box is settled into the ooze at the bottom. It sounds like something that you'd like to take on. The product would round out our company's product offerings, Bill said kegally. I thought about of that. We don't have any corrugated box capability right now. But that also means that we have no ready base of customers for the products. The price is low at $250,000. Mr. Tavallo seemed a bit desperate when he thought that we weren't interested. You're forgetting the $400,000 in debt, I said. No, I was only referring to the immediate payout to the owner. We'd have to find out how the debt is structured, but according to Mr. Tavallo, there would only be another $130,000 needed to bring everything current. With the sale of the Timberlands, we have more than enough cash on hand to get both companies. You sound like the idea of buying North Country Paper Box excites you? I think that it does a little. It would be more of a challenge to straighten it out and get it producing than taking over Eastern business forms. And it's only an hour's drive from Brandon. That's closer than Greenfield. I take it that you would vote to buy it if it was put to a vote? He grinned. I guess that I would, assuming that it was put to a vote. I must have caught this acquisition fever from you, D.D. 
That's all for now, see you in the next video. Please share your valuable opinion and please support me on Patreon to get the early access. Link in the first comment.